The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 13221 in the name of Dave Thompson on Caledonian Canal World First. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Dave Thompson to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Thompson. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it's a great pleasure to lead today's debate on the Caledonian Canal, which is a fantastic asset to my constituency of Skylach Harbour and Badenoch, and indeed to my colleague Fergus Ewing's Inverness and Nairn uh, constituency as well. Now, this majestic canal is considered by many as one of the greatest waterways of the world. Running from Fort William in the west to Inverness in the east, this 60-mile coast-to-coast channel passes through peaceful settlements, spectacular locks, and beautiful countryside. The scenery is awe-inspiring along its whole length, dominated by Scotland's highest mountains, including the UK's highest, Ben Nevis, which indeed dominates the skyline above Fort William. And of course, it makes full use of Loch Ness, the UK's deepest loch, as well as utilising the natural waterways of Loch Lochie and Loch Oich. Of course, it had been predicted as the famous Highland seer, Kenneth Mackenzie, known as the Bran seer, prophesied that, and I quote, full rigged ships will be seen sailing eastward and westward by the back of Tom Nahurich. Tom Nahurich is a hill a mile or so from the sea in Inverness. It took 17 years to complete and provided employment at its peak to some 1,800 folk, including Scottish, English and Irish labourers. It remained the preeminent, most technically advanced trans-sea ship canal of its kind until the Panama Canal opened in 1914, which is, of course, 12 miles shorter than its Highland rival. When Neptune's staircase at Banavie Locks was built, it was the longest length of masonry on any canal in the world. The poet Robert Southey, a friend of Telford, said it was, and again I quote, the greatest work of art in Britain. Would uh, Mr Thompson give way? Yes, certainly. Does, uh, sorry, officer, does Mr Thompson recall, as I do, that the late Charles Kennedy had singled out Neptune's staircase as his own favourite special place in Scotland and visitor attraction, and that he was a great champion of the Caledonian Canal? Dave Thompson. I, I do indeed, uh, Mr Ewing, recollect that, and uh, myself and Veronica, who met Charles and indeed his wife Sarah and son Donald on a number of occasions uh, in the constituency over the years, were very saddened indeed to hear uh, of the, the death of a very fine man. The highest part of the canal is at Loch Oich, which is 106 feet above sea level, and there are 29 locks four aqueducts and ten bridges in total along the canal. The Inverness Courier reported on the 3rd of October 1817 that on Saturday last, a sloop and a barge laden with coals went through the Caledonian Canal to Fort Augustus, having lain for some hours below the Mutant drawbridge. The inhabitants of Inverness were apprised of the circumstances and the novelty soon attracted a vast concourse of all ranks and ages. The banks were literally lined with spectators. After 17 years, the canal fully opened in 1822 with the Inverness Courier of the 24th of October enthusiastically reporting that at 10 o'clock yesterday morning, the Loch Ness steam yacht departed from the locks of Muirton on the first voyage through the canal amidst the loud and enthusiastic cheering and the firing of cannon. Then in 1834, another Scot, James Walker from Falkirk, who had worked for years designing Surrey commercial docks, succeeded Telford as president of the Institute of Civil Engineers and secured £300,000 in government funding to head for the Highlands to enhance and deepen the, lock, the locks. This required the canal to be closed until 1847, but once repaired, enhanced and deepened, it began to attract upwards of 500 vessels a year, including ships bound for the Baltic trade. The Caledonian Canal is only seven years uh, short of its bicentenary, as completed by Telford. But what of the canal today? From the Bewley Firth to the Atlantic, it remains a major tourism attraction, with families able to sail its length on cruisers, 
and it is also used by ships to avoid perilous routes around the north of Scotland. Soon there will be a network of alpine-style camping pods commissioned by Scottish canals sighted along the route, offering walkers, water users and cyclers, uh, un cyclists a unique overnight stay in a distinctive, compact, modern structure that allows them to sense the unique nature of their location alongside the canal. The pods are inspired by the, the old box beds used in Highland Croft houses, which are micro rooms containing just the bed with vertical sides, a lid and wooden doors, but they are also helpfully designed to mirror staying in a snug croft house or bothy. Recently, one of the canal's most iconic buildings <coughs> has been brought back to life as a unique holiday cottage. Officially opened by the Transport Minister, Derek Mackay, in December last year, Bona Lighthouse was designed in 1815 by Telford and was the smallest manned inland lighthouse in Britain, guiding vessels between the waters of Loch Ness and the Great Canal. The new cottages offer visitors to the area the perfect spot to explore the spectacular landscapes off the highlands or simply relax and watch the world and maybe even a boat or two pass by. Once an example of cutting-edge technology, Bona guided ships into the canal for more than a century before technological advances rendered it obsolete and it fell into disuse. However, the refurbishment means we now have another tangible link to our Highland heritage, ensuring that the visiting public will benefit and secure, securing additional income for Scottish canals, which will help maintain the asset for future generations. I'll be visiting Bona tomorrow with Andrew Thin, who is the chair of Scottish Canals, and I'm thoroughly looking forward to seeing Bona's restoration for myself. So what of the canal's future? Might we see a rotating boat lift such as the Muirton Wheel to rival the Falkirk Wheel, which is the Millennium Link project, which connects the Forth and Clyde Canal with the Union Canal? Perhaps this is a venture worth delving into a little deeper, and I shall hand it over to my colleague Fergus uh, Ewing. The Central Belt uh, not only has the Falkirk wheel, but the fantastic Kelpies too. There's no reason why we should not try to emulate this with the Caledonian Canal. And I'm sure there will be countless other suggestions as to how we can maximise the canal's undoubted appeal well into the future. In closing, Presiding Officer, I like to think of the many Highland folk involved in the construction of the Caledonian Canal and its resulting success, all of whom have long since passed away. I hope that when they allow themselves a nostalgic muse from attending to their crofts and their livestock, those historical shadows of the original project who brought and learned a great many skills in bringing the world famous canal to life will be looking and on and nodding with satisfied approval. Many thanks. I now turn to the open debate, speeches of four minutes or so. David Stewart to be followed by Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you uh, very much, President Officer, and could I start by congratulating uh, Dave Thompson for securing his debate today, and could I also associate myself about the remarks made by Mr uh, Thompson and by Mr Ewing about the late Charles Kennedy. The Caledon Canal, as we've heard, is the largest of the Scottish canals, linking Loch Oich, Ness, Lochie and Dufour together over a distance of 60 miles along the line of the awe-inspiring Great Glen. As we've heard from Dave Thompson, the canal, of course, was built to provide a safe passage for ships travelling from the North Sea to the Atlantic coast. Of course, in the early 19th century, it was a long and dangerous journey through the Pentland Firth and around Cape Wrath, made worse, of course, by the war with France. That's why the building of this particular canal was so important. It meant our shipping could avoid the dangers of the Pentland Firth to get from east to west and vice versa. Of course, the building project also had the added advantage of providing much-needed work for the Highland population and beyond. Of course, William Jessop and Thomas Telford were appointed as project engineers and construction began in 1803. It was expected to take just seven years to complete. To link the locks of the Great Glen, 22 miles of artificial waterway had to be dug by hand and 28 huge locks constructed, large enough to take a battleship. And vast basins were also dug at each end to provide trade and industry. And at that time, the canal was one of the largest civil engineering schemes ever taken place in Britain. It was the Queensferry crossing of its day. The canal was finally completed with the Great Ceremony in 1822 
But I note, presiding officer, it was at twice the projected costs. I think we've been there before in terms of large uh, projects. As we've heard from Dave Thompson, by uh, 1844, major repairs were needed, which closed the canal for three years. Nevertheless, I would stress that the canal was, and still is, a feat of great engineering acknowledged across the globe. Now, some may say it was sad that the canal never achieved at the time it was built quite the grand design for which it was formed of carrying seaborne vessels from sea to sea. Although, of course, there was an upsurge in commercial traffic during the First World War, when components for the construction of mines were stripped through the canal on the way to Inverness from America. Ownership passed to the Ministry of Transport in 1920 and then to British Waterways and subsequently to Scottish Canals. Members may be surprised to know that the canal is now a scheduled ancient monument and attracts over half a million visitors uh, per year. Queen Victoria took a trip in 1873 and, and the publicity surrounding the trip resulted in a large increase in visitors in the region, and these numbers have grown ever since. Dave Thompson's touched on one of the key campaigns I've been involved in over the last decade, which is Bona Lighthouse, which, as we've heard, was designed by Thomas Telford, incidentally on the site of a toll booth, which was there many hundreds of years uh, before. If I may raise the presiding officer Ray indulgent, indulgence, a six degrees of separation point, which, as members will know, means that... Uh, it, we're only six steps away from everyone in the planet. My current office at Three Gordon Terrace in Inverness was an hotel in the 1880s, and then that building where Thomas Telford resided when carrying out the work on the canal. I'm sure he probably shared a room with Stuart Stevenson at the time as well. <laughs> um, I am campaigning, uh, President Officer, to have the building recognised as an historic connection, and I hope we can get cross-party support for this. I will be approaching Historic Scotland through its Blue Plaque Award to make sure that this bit of history is recognised. And I'm delighted, as I said, after 10 years campaigning to have the lighthouse restored. Scottish Canals took up the challenge and commissioned the work to turn Bona Lighthouse into two holiday cottages. Work was completed last year, just in time for the 200th anniversary. Um, I've uh, probably beat Dave Thompson to it because I've visited him many times and I think it's a first-class piece of workmanship. So the light that once guided ships from Loch Ness into the canal has been retained in what now is the master bedroom of one of the apartments, with the lamp now acting as an unusual bedside illumination. A number of period features have been retained in both apartments, adding to the historic nature of the building and further adding to the whole tourist experience on a visit to the canal. So in conclusion, presiding officer, the Caledon Canal is deemed rightly to be one of the greatest waterways of the world. Who would have thought it could have achieved that accolade over 200 years ago? There is a lesson here for all of us. As others have said, we are our best when we are at our boldest. And to paraphrase Sir Walter Scott, we need the soul to do and the will to dare. The time has come to open a new chapter in the life of the Caledon Canal and to mark the outstanding features and beauty of this iconic landmark to the world at large and build on the tourist attraction that it already is. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Jamie McGregor to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Dave Stewart's right. Uh, the Caledonia Canal is considered by many, correctly in my view, as one of the greatest waterways in the world. All of us can marvel at the inspired efforts of the great Thomas Telford and his colleague William Jessop for their pioneering engineering works, which have truly stood the test of time. And we should not underestimate the difficulties of the challenges they've faced. Um, 22 miles of new canal, 29 locks, uh, through difficult terrain without the mechanized and advanced technology which civil engineers take for granted today. The Inverness Courier said at the time of its opening in October 1822 that it had transformed Scotland's geography with the western joined to the eastern sea. And the history of the Caledonian Canal is genuinely fascinating. Conceived as a way to provide a shortcut for trawlers and cargo ships seeking to avoid the long and treacherous voyage around the north of Scotland, it was also envisaged as a safe transport route for naval frigates during the Napoleonic War. Um, and it helped also bring employment. Uh, and you, although sadly, like many public sector projects in the almost two centuries, since it came in 12, it came in 12 years late and massively over budget, but it was the first ever state-funded transport project in the UK. Um, it was much used militarily in World War I, especially in shipping components for the construction of mines through the canal on their way to Inverness from America. 
Our fishing boats used it to avoid the route around the north of Scotland, and again in a similar way in World War II. Today, as Dave Thompson has said, it's a very significant tourist attraction in my region. Visitors to flock what is a stunning location for a canal boat holiday or any kind of cruising, or indeed to catch a glimpse of Nessie. Walkers and ramblers can walk the full length of the canal on the Great Glen Way. These many hundreds of thousands of visitors contribute a great deal to the economy, and they can all be sure of a very warm Highland welcome, and I encourage colleagues who have not visited the canal here to do so. During the never-to-be-forgotten year of foot and mouth, so devastating to Scottish farmers and crofters, I became involved with a sortie of 140 small French and Dutch boats who took part in what they called the Great Glen Raid on the Caledonian Canal. It was a tremendous event, made all the more difficult by the foot-and-mouth regulations, but still it took place, and I made a speech in French to the assembled throng of sailors at the social club in Fort William and pointed out how useful the canal had been in defeating Napoleon, which went down very well with the Dutch, not so well with the French. Uh, but the canal is revered by boating enthusiasts from many countries. Uh, from the tourism angle, I'm well aware of the two independent boat hirers, Cali Cruises from Inverness and West Highland Sailing, who are based at Lagan. The latter also incorporates Le Boat, a pan-European company, and between them, they have 34 cruisers. The Le Boat contingent are mostly from outside the UK, worldwide, so bringing very valuable tourism from the UK and the rest of the world. But on a slightly sour note, it's rumoured that Scottish canals want to turn the Lagan car park, which has always been free, into a fee-paying car park. And I think this is counterproductive and also is not using public money to build a cafe there when there is one there already. Perhaps a little counterproductive as well. My belief is that Scottish canals should improve the infrastructure for the facilities for the cruises and the Scottish Government should make this possible through a bit of funding. And I don't believe there are any canals throughout Europe which do not rely on state funding, nor are there any canals which have a built-in monster. Um, and maintaining the canal in good condition requires constant work by Scottish canals and is constantly. Incidentally, on the monster front, uh, I asked a visiting class from uh, Fort Augustus School yesterday if any of them had seen the monster, and a young man called Roland said he had seen it recently uh, near Urquhart Castle, and I was very glad to hear that. And if I might just conclude by saying I'm also I'm delighted that repairs are being done to the towpaths by Scottish canals, because I am honorary president of the Highland Disabled Ramblers Association, who have been known to ramble with their scooters along the canal towpaths, and I'm sure they will be delighted with the upgrades so their rides are safer and less bumpy, and there is less chance of any of them ending up in the canal. And on that point, uh, I'll, I'll give up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and congratulations to Dave Thompson for giving us the opportunity to uh, debate this important topic. And, of course, as invited by Dave Stewart, I tell him that uh, my wife and I were married in Bona Kirk in 1969, and my mother-in-law and my now wife lived at Loch End, a mere 400, 500 metres from Bona Lighthouse. And indeed, uh, that contributed, the canal did, uh, to the good eating in the Perry household, because whenever a fishing boat came through, my mother-in-law used to dash up and persuade the fishermen to provide her with some free fish, uh, which was excellent uh, nutrition. Um, I'm delighted to hear that uh, Mr. Thompson will be meeting Andrew Thin uh, shortly, give him my regards. He was always one of the most effective uh, public appointments uh, uh, to, to, to a chair, and I'm delighted to hear of his continuing uh, contribution. Um, Jimmy McGregor said that uh, the canal is the only canal with its own monster. Well, that's almost certainly true. Uh, interesting little footnote to that is there's been a thousand new species of marine animals discovered in the last 12 months alone. And given that this is the deepest, longest, biggest uh, body of water, in fact, in aggregate, it exceeds the sum of all bodies of water in the UK, um, there is plenty of space for even large animals to yet be discovered uh, if we but to turn our minds uh, to it. Now, of course, we've had the canal led the world for 100 years. 
Um, it, of course, was not the earliest canal by any manner of means. In my constituency, for example, the St Fergus and North Oogie Canal um, it was provided. It never seems to have delivered very much, I have to say, and all sign of it has disappeared. The canal also had a broader context. Uh, Thomas Telford undertook uh, something that we now think of as a modern invention, which was a master plan uh, of transport in the Highlands, uh, which included uh, revising uh, parts of the Crinan Canal, building 920 miles of new roads, building over 1,000 new bridges, and, critically to my constituents, improving the harbours at Peterhead and at Banff. So it was part of a programme of public works uh, which benefited the Highlands, created employment, but by creating new infrastructure, laid the future uh, for important developments, which we continue to exploit today uh, through, uh, through tourism. And, of course, Thomas Telford, who came from the borders, from Dumfrieshire, uh, in founding the Institution of Civil Engineers in 1818 and being its first president, contributed to the intellectual life of uh, Scotland as well. And he was recognised as a very effective poet. So to be an engineer is not to disconnect you uh, from the world uh, of the, 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 the arts. Uh, the canal itself, of course, um, remains a very significant part of our infrastructure. 29 locks and, as we've heard, an important part of our defence infrastructure. Indeed, the parliamentary debates that preceded the passing of the Act on the 27th of July, 1803, majored in providing the then wooden ships that we had with protection from Napoleon's uh, marauders around the coasts of Scotland. That's one of the reasons, of course, the defeat of Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo, why work on the canal slowed down a bit because once Napoleon was defeated, uh, some of the urgency appears to have gone out uh, of the construction of the canal. I want to just close by saying that, of course, the least remembered loch of the canal, Loch Dofur, the smallest one, uh, is the one uh, on the shores of which, uh, in the adjacent market gardens, my mother-in-law used to work. So I have a wheen of connections with this canal, which I'm delighted to bring to your attention. And as for the brands here, poor soul, burnt in oil at Shannonry Point, in sight across the uh, firth uh, of the entrance of the canal. I very much congratulate Mr Thompson presiding officer. Many thanks. And our last open debate speaker is Hans Alamalik. Thank you very much and good afternoon, presiding officer. I thank Dave Thompson for bringing this motion for debate to the, uh, on the Caledonian Canal today. The Caledonian Canal has a great history that links some of the major elements of Scotland, a great piece of engineering going through some of the most stunning landscape, landscapes in the world. As a feature of engineering and design, I feel that the Caledonian Canal was extremely ambitious to link the locks of the Great Glen, 22 miles of artificial waterways is an achievement in its own right. The canal itself contained, connected the highlands to the rest of Scotland, linking Inverness with places like Glasgow, my own hometown. I'm all, Scotland can be proud of its recent achievements in pro, promoting and developing the canal as a great community space, not only for those who are on the water, but for those who enjoy the walk or a bike ride or a buggy ride for that matter uh, on the canal, canal slip paths. Uh, of course, the most iconic addition to the regeneration of Scotland's canal system is the Kelpies which I recently visited with my mother, and we both thoroughly enjoyed the Skypies, and I hope to take my grandchildren there, hopefully this weekend, if I get the opportunity. The Skypies have become an iconic public artwork created by Andy Scott, who is from, of course, my hometown of Glasgow. You'll notice that Glasgow is featuring a lot in the speech, presiding officer. The two tall horse heads make, made of steel now stand alongside the Fort and, canal, and Clyde Canal near Falkirk, the outdoor recreation park between Falkirk and Grangemouth. 
My own constituency of Glasgow has a major canal side um, redevelopment project, including plans for, a, for our own Big Man Bridge and sculpt, sculptured by, once again, Andy Scott in Mary Hill. This is uh, coupled with uh, several other projects, including the Mary Hill trans uh, Transformation Regeneration Access TRA, which will focus on building a mixture of affordable homes as well as creating training and jobs opportunities for local people. So the canals still continue to play a very important role for us. As the Kelpies um, have become such a well-loved landmark so quickly, many of my constituents are expecting uh, to draw uh, on the, the sculpture which will facilitate uh, the, the bridge in Glasgow. However, many people have been saying before we spend the 4.5 million pounds on the bridge, we should spend a few on cleaning the canal and making the paths more friendly in terms of using. Mr Malik, in, in your last minute, perhaps you could relate some of this back to the Caledonian Canal, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank it'll you. be my pleasure, presiding officer. Uh, however, in a bid not to take anything away from all those people who are working very hard on all the various projects in terms of regeneration of the areas all along um, Scotland, I would like to say that I want to wish everybody connected with the canals who are working so hard to make a difference in Scotland in terms of, one, identifying our own uh, heritage and also uh, building on our newfound culture and arts. Thank you very much, presiding Officer. Many thanks. And can I now call on Derek Mackay to respond to the debate. Minister, seven minutes or so, please. OK, thank you very much, presiding officer. And I am delighted to be responding on behalf of the Scottish Government. And in doing so, uh, can I congratulate Dave Thompson for securing this debate and focusing our minds on the Caledonian uh, Canal. Uh, I think members have contributed very constructively, including Hanzala Malik's clearly funding application for his Glasgow uh, projects uh, for the canal's work there. But I think he makes a very helpful point around the importance of regeneration uh, packages uh, when they come together around canals. Moving on the perception uh, that canals are areas of dereliction and abandonment and actually can be uh, areas for regeneration and economic activity. And so in uh, lies that wonderful structure, that historic uh, structure and potential around the Caledonian Canal that's been so successful as a very important historic asset and indeed at the time was a groundbreaking uh, project uh, in its day, one of the, the legacies of the great Scottish engineer Thomas uh, Telford. And it's difficult to imagine the Great Glen without this magnificent thread uh, running through its length. Now, we had a revelation in the Chamber of the Scottish Parliament here today, and it will be on the official record now that the Loch Ness Monster does indeed exist. How do we know so? Because Jamie McGregor set, met someone who said they saw it. So it will now be an official matter um, for the Scottish Parliament on the record that it does exist. So the media will be standing by ready to, to report this across uh, the world. Uh, oh, I have competition now. I'll, I'll take Stuart, Stuart Stevenson. Um, the Minister will be aware that at the end of the year the proceedings of the Scots Parliament are bound and placed as a legally enforceable document in the National Library of Scotland to give added force to his remarks. Minister. Indeed, Stuart Stevenson, so that would now make it uh, official. So my greatest accolade now in the Scottish Parliament is I have made the Loch Ness Monster a real being and I now take Dave Stewart. David Stewart. Would the um, Minister share my view that the Loch Ness Monster is probably looking for floating voters? <laughs> Minister. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to respond to that. The ministerial briefing notes haven't paid me for this slight diversion. Since we're on the subjects of, of diversion, I did notice that Dave Stewart challenged Stuart Stevenson to make a personal connection, and he made two. I'm sure he's got some relation to the Loch Ness Monster as well. Uh, going by the contributions made uh, thus far. Uh, can I say, since we've departed uh, from etiquette in the Chamber, I'm sure you'll also allow me to briefly 
uh, welcome our visitors from the Singing Children of Africa to the Scottish Parliament as well, guests from Kenya, and I'm delighted that they are here present and they'll also now feature in the official record of the Scottish Parliament. So back to the Caledonian uh, Canal for a couple of minutes. It has had a huge contribution to uh, tourism uh, in Scotland uh, as well. The canal accounts for approximately 14% of total Highland tourism spend and supports around uh, 500 jobs uh, locally. Scottish canals who own and manage all our canals on behalf of the people of Scotland work with a number of businesses and public sector partners to deliver a wide range of activities and some members have touched upon them. And I report to the Chamber uh, that I met with the Board of, of Scottish Canals just last week on the, as it happens, Caledonian uh, Canal, my first ever meeting held uh, on, on a barge. Now, the, the core users of the canal are, of course, boaters, around yachts and, and partly uh, fishing vessels uh, as well and still in use across mainland uh, Europe. But last year it's reported over a thousand vessels transited the Caledonian Canal, a quite uh, substantial and impressive uh, figure. And the Great Glen has always been a natural route uh, for uh, travellers and the Caledonian Canal has been a magnet for these uh, activities, but also the use of the towpaths as well for walkers and, and cyclists uh, too, and there's been substantial towpath improvements that have been delivered along the length of the Caledonian Canal, delivering more than 20 kilometres of upgrade, attracting a million pounds of Scottish Government and other public and investment. So I was delighted to meet with pupils from Dochgarch Primary School as they enjoyed uh, the improvements that have been made in terms of the towpath. There's also work around the canoe trail that was launched in 2011 by Scottish Canals, and the paddlers have greatly enjoyed uh, the improvements there as well. In the last uh, two years, paddle activity companies have located businesses and bases uh, on the canal. Other investments are being made along the canal corridor. At Lag and Lochs, investment totalling £360,000 has been made in establishing a Bothy location, outdoor activities hub and kiosk. £155,000 of this funding comes from the Scottish Government Scenic Routes Initiative to create a visitor facility at Lagan. Young architects have designed an eye-catching kiosk which will complement its spectacular location. In addition, Scottish Canals is committed to developing new tourist infrastructure at Port Augustus and the busiest tourist spot on the Caledonian uh, Canal. And I look forward to those uh, developments. And as part of the Scottish Scenic Route programme, a brief is being developed for a viewing platform at Neptune, mentioned earlier, Neptune Staircase, at the western end of the canal. And Scottish Canals is developing plans to celebrate this spectacular location with arguably the best view of Ben Nevis. Scottish Canals have redeveloped a number of its historic buildings along the canal, making them available as high quality lets, including the Bona Lighthouse at Loch Ness, that a number uh, of members have mentioned, and I was delighted. Uh, to open uh, as the appropriate uh, minister, and I'm sure of a fantastic uh, future. The Caledonian Canal is a historic monument, but unusually one that is still fully operational. With a structure of its age and properly maintained, it will continue to have a future. But you'll all be aware of, in March this year, a major breach occurred at Kaloche, at the east of Loch Oich, uh, with the height of the loch dropping 1.5 metres. And we do, of course, require Scottish canals to hold reserves uh, to manage uh, such uh, incidents, but I was delighted to be able to intervene with financial support to uh, Scottish Canals. So looking to the future, Scottish Canals have attracted the World's Canal Conference to Inverness, where it will be held in September 2016, and this will be a great opportunity to show the Caledonian Canal to an international audience, and will also be a platform for Scottish businesses involved in innovative areas of engineering, water asset management and tourism to showcase products and services. So once again, uh, can I congratulate all of those who have contributed to the success of the Caledonian Canal, past, present and future. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes Dave Thompson's debate on the Caledonian Canal, world first, and I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30pm.